This video is an affiliation with Collingwood Insurance. There's a great deal via the link right now, but more on that one later. Today, I'm gonna to talk about driving in the rain because it's the UK and it is raining. And if you're in the UK, this video should be quite important because apparently it rains one in every three days. Well, one in every three days it rains someplace in the UK. Maybe all of it, maybe just a bit of it. I don't want to state the obvious, but put your windscreen wipers on. Look at your owner's manual. If you're not sure how they work, it should tell you how they work. But generally you can have intermittent, which is when, I'll just turn you to the wipers, when they go every so often. So this one will go every four seconds on this setting. I can control how often it goes. And you can put it up a bit more, or you can have it on high here, fast. You can also do the back wiper. To do the back wiper, on this one I push it forwards, and that, that does the back wiper, but you don't generally leave that on. That is really to clean your window when it gets lots of spray and dirt on it. If you leave that on, it doesn't always get very much rainwater on there. It tends to get spray on it, so you end up just smearing salt water or muck or whatever sprays up on there. So do that as and when you need to. And if your wipers are on, use your headlights because the rule is, it's not actually the rule, it's not actually the law in the UK, it is in some parts of the world, but a good rule is, if your wipers are on, put your headlights on as well. Not so you can see, it makes no difference to you, but other people can see you better. And that's not side lights, we're talking normal dipped beams, which on this car is here, and it's always that symbol. Also put some air on your windows to stop your windows misting up. This is the symbol you need, this one here. If you press that, that will direct air to your windows. Warm or hot is okay. Hot works better because hot will evaporate that mist. This car also has this setting here where I can press that and it will direct a lot more air onto the windows to evaporate the mist more quickly. It blows air out of here to get rid of the mist on the front windows and out of these side vents here and here to do the side windows, particularly where the wing mirrors are. If you want to clear the back window, press the square one here, the square symbol. Doesn't come on in this car unless I turn the engine on. So I'll just start the engine. There we go, that's started now. It uses a lot of electricity, this one. And then I can press that and now the back window will heat up to evaporate the mist. It has little lines on the back window that get hot and then the mist evaporates. Air conditioning is best because air conditioning also dries out the air which dry air means obviously there's less, less uh, moisture in the air to condense on the windows causing mist. So air conditioning will be your friend when it rains, not just in the summer. Something that may help you is understanding that the curved symbol always means the front window and the square symbol always means the rear window. And the same applies for the wipers as well. You've got curved on there and square. So the curve is for the front window and the square is for the back window. If you're on the motorway in severe rain with a lot of spray and your visibility is severely reduced, I use the rear fog light. Not everyone recommends this and it's a bit of an argument because some people say if you put your rear fog light on then people aren't going to see your brake lights. Well with my car it only has one fog light so with the brake lights you've got the middle and the sides and just having one on the side as the fog light I don't think obscures from the brake lights too much but I think you've got to be a judge of that yourself because if you're struggling to see PDP in front of you because the spray is so bad that the visibility is so poor that you cannot see through the, through the spray to see the car in front, people are struggling to see you and I want to make sure they can see me so I will put that rear fog light on. However, as soon as the spray says was down and I start to gain my visibility again, I will turn it off straight away. To turn the fog lights on in this car, firstly, you've got to turn the headlights on. Uh, and the symbols are the same in all cars anyway. And then these symbols here are your fog lights. The first click out is your front fog light, which is green. And your next click out is your rear fog light, which is orange. However, that hasn't brightened up down here. The light hasn't come on. And that is because by law, it has to be in your line of sight. So the light actually comes on up here. It's only the rear one that needs to be in your line of sight because it's only actually a rear fog light that legally needs to be fitted to a car in the UK. But you need to know and remember that your rear fog light is on so that you can turn it off when the fog or the rain eventually clears. When you get in your car on a wet day, be careful with your pedals. Use them more carefully. Be a little bit slower when you're controlling the car because your feet will be slippery. Over time, the heater will dry them out but there is a risk of you slipping off one of those pedals if you're not careful. 
And that brings me on to how fast you should drive when it's raining. You don't only want to be more careful with the pedals, but your driving in general needs to be a little bit more calm, a little slower, maybe reduce your speed, increase the stopping distance between you and the car in front. It does take up to twice as long to stop in the wet as it does in the dry. So you need to be going at a speed where you can make sure you can stop within that distance you can see to be clear. This is certainly more true on motorways and fast country roads than it is on urban roads. On motorways and fast country roads, you're going faster, so the rain makes a bigger difference. Hitting standing water at speed is more dangerous than hitting standing water. Standing water is a puddle, by the way, just a fancy term for a big puddle, but it's more dangerous to hit a puddle um, on a motorway at motorway speeds than it is in town, at town speeds. So your driving is going to change quite a lot on motorways and country roads. You're probably going to reduce your speed by, I don't know, 20 maybe even 30%, but in town, you're not actually gonna reduce your speed that much. However, leave longer to go where you're trying to go because whenever it rains, it always takes longer to get anywhere. Now I said a 20 or 30% speed reduction, but I can't actually tell you how much slower to go. That comes down to you, it's completely variable and totally depends on how severe the weather is. You gotta make sure you feel safe. You gotta make sure you feel like you can stop if something in front happens that's bad. For example, maybe someone walks in the road from between two cars, uh, you can't see the side of a zebra crossing, so you slow down to make sure no one's at the zebra crossing. Someone pulls out of a junction just around the bend. Can you deal with that? If you feel like you can't, then you're driving too fast. Also, don't rely on people to drive sensibly. Expect people to do things that really aren't sensible. Make allowances for that because people do silly things sometimes, especially on the road. Now I'm going to talk about aquaplaning, also known as hydroplaning. Aquaplaning is when your tyre no longer makes contact with the road because there's a layer of water between it and the road. Generally, this happens when you hit deep water. What should you do in that situation? Well, firstly, there's not a huge amount you can do and not a huge amount you should do because when you aquaplane, you actually lose control of the car. You lose your accelerator, brake and steering. You can't really do much. But if you try to do a lot, you're going to be in trouble once the tyre makes contact with the road again. Because generally you don't aquaplane for long because puddles aren't normally, they don't go on forever puddles, they do stop. So once you're through that puddle, you're going to get grip again. If you were to steer left or right loads or brake loads, once you get grip, the car's going to suddenly react and you may have an accident, you may crash. So if the car starts drifting left or right, which it probably will do when you're aquaplaning, it will always drift one way or the other, just try and turn a little bit to guide the car back to where you want to go. And when you make contact with the road again, when you get grip, the car will then go back where you want to go nicely, gently, not harshly. When you're aquaplaning, reduce the gas. There's no need to come off it completely. You can, but it's better to have a little bit of gas so that when you get through the puddle and you get grip again, you don't get a sudden amount of engine braking which can unsettle the car. But that brings me on to cruise control now. You shouldn't really use cruise control in heavy rain. It's okay in light rain, but in heavy rain where there's puddles, it's a bad idea. Because when you hit that puddle, the wheels could spin up and make you lose control. However, this car does have a system where if it detects I've hit a puddle, it will cut the cruise control out immediately and it does react very fast. So it's not that dangerous in this car, however, I still rather use manual control of the accelerator with my foot because I can react to things in front of me. Cruise control keeps me at a steady speed, which is nice on long journeys, but it also means I'm a bit slower to react to problems. So if there's a deep puddle up ahead and I'm doing it manually, I can sort of go oh, puddle, brake a little bit and try and get some speed off before the puddle. I won't be braking through the puddle. I'll come off the brake to go through it. You don't want to break through the puddle, as I explained earlier, but that will make that puddle safer now and reduce my chances of aquaplaning as much because I'm at a lower speed. Cruise control wouldn't do that. Cruise control doesn't see the puddle and doesn't slow down, but you probably will. Now I'm going to talk about understeer and oversteer. Firstly, understeer. Basically, understeer is when the front end loses grip. So you steer right round the bend, but the car doesn't go round that bend as much as you want it to. So if you get that feeling where you're steering and the car's not turning, don't do what you think you should do. Normally, people steer more 
to compensate for the fact it's not working, but that only makes it worse. What you actually have to do is steer a little bit less, slow down, and then hopefully when you steer next time, there's a little bit more grip because you're going a bit slower. Hopefully there's enough space for you to do that. Then there's oversteer. Oversteer is when the rear end of the car loses grip. I'm not gonna be able to get you good at dealing with oversteer in a video. That's a skill that takes a lot of practice off road, but I can tell you what it is. So you're going round a right hand bend, then the rear end of the car loses grip and the car goes into a right hand spin or a clockwise spin. What most people do, which is the correct thing to do, is steer against the skid or the opposite direction to the skid, which stops you spinning and that's great. But because they panic and steer all the way, they just end up spinning the opposite direction and going into a spin the other way and crashing on the other side. What you have to do is steer quickly. Once the spin stops, hold the steering steady. So this is a car, it's starting to spin. Steer in the opposite direction. Once the car stops adding angle, hold the steering steady and you'll find the car will slide sideways for a little bit. When it comes back, it's gonna come back quick, which is why you don't wanna add more than you need. Be ready to straighten the wheel quickly. So it starts to go into a spin, you steer in the opposite direction, then you hold it once it stops adding angle and stays there, it goes sideways and eventually it's gonna snap back the other way. Once it starts to snap back, straighten your wheel quick. Because if you don't get your wheel straight, you'll go into a spin the other way. It's very hard to control oversteer. It takes a lot of practice. Better to come off the gas when that happens in a rear wheel drive car, but most cars are front wheel drive. If it's front wheel drive you're in, keep your foot on the gas a bit because that can actually help you, can actually help pull you out of that spin if you get the steering right. But the best way to stay safe in wet weather is to have good rubber. All four corners of the car, all four wheels should have at least three millimeters of tread. I know the legal limit is 1.6 millimeters of tread, but three is significantly safer than 1.6. You have much less chance of aquaplaning. 1.6 is really cutting it fine. Not really ideal for wet weather. Now there's a nice deep puddle that normally forms where I live, as you can see at the moment, quite a lot of splashing there. What you wanna do when you see deep water like that is go slow and try and go to the shallow, most shallow part of the puddle. Most of the time, that's the middle of the puddle because a road is often shaped like that, higher in the middle, but lower at the sides. So the rain goes to the drains either side of the road. So going in the middle will be more shallow. That's why you'll see a lot of other drivers go to the middle as well. A good way to judge how deep it is, is to look at the curb. If you look at the curb, you can see how far up the curb the water is. You never want to drive in water that is deeper than about a third of the way up your wheel. Certainly not halfway up your wheel. If it's halfway up your wheel, then you're going to risk, uh, well, possibly floating, I guess, but more than likely, you'll just get some water come through the bottoms of the doors as you drive through it. So I'm going to go through this deep puddle now. And uh, you can see it's quite deep. We'll get a bit closer to it. You can see it's right the way up the curb on the right, where the bus stop is. It goes right the way up there. So it's only as deep as a curb. It's still deep, but it's not going to be a third of the way up my wheel. Certainly not halfway up my wheel. So I should be able to go through in the middle nice and slowly. Certainly less than 10 miles an hour where it's more shallow. And yes, that is very deep. Created quite a bit of a, a bow wave there, but I didn't create a huge splash from going through it quickly. If you're driving on a country road, or any road for that matter, and you see there's deep puddles either side, don't be afraid to go in the middle like these people are here. I'm actually slowing down to let them use the middle. And now I'm gonna go in the middle where the puddle isn't and avoid the puddle. Of course, you're hoping for the oncoming car to let you finish. It looks like they're slowing down and letting me finish. Thank you very much, I'll just say thank you. If, it clear, if it's clear that they're not gonna do that, you're gonna to have to slow down and go into the puddle. But doing that is slower because it means you both gotta go through really slowly. Depends on how busy it is really. But on a road like this, it's not too busy. It's quicker just to slow down, let someone go through at a higher speed, then go through yourself. But if it was really busy, it might be quicker just, it probably would be quicker, just for both of you to carry on at the same time, nice and slowly. 
In the UK, it is illegal to splash pedestrians. You can get fined for splashing a pedestrian when you're driving. It's also mean, so avoid splashing pedestrians. If you see a deep puddle, slow down, create less of a splash. If water gets in your engine, it will destroy your engine. It doesn't take much water to destroy a healthy engine. It's known as hydrolocking. That's why serious off-roaders have like a tube going up the side of their windscreen, up this A-pillar, so that it's called a snorkel, just like you have when you go snorkeling, so that the car can breathe in deep water and reduce the risk of getting water inside the engine. You can get water in the engine via the exhaust as well, which is why if you're in really deep water and you think it's coming up to as high as your exhaust, A, don't do that unless you're in a specialist vehicle, don't do that on the road, you want to keep the gas on. If that happens, if you think water might be going in your exhaust, try and keep the gas on so the, so the exhaust keeps blowing. You don't want the exhaust sucking because when you come off the gas, the exhaust can suck a little bit back. And if you get that water into your engine through the exhaust, that can also destroy your engine that way too. Water in engine, very bad. The way to stay on the gas is to push the clutch down. So let's say you're going through deep water and you want to slow down. Instead of coming off the gas, Maybe just push the clutch down, put it into neutral whilst keeping your foot on that gas pedal. Then you can use your left foot to brake. I don't recommend doing this without practice first and practice off-road, but that kind of driving is specific for off-road driving. That way you'll be able to stay on the gas, keep the exhaust pumping, and then when you want to get going again, you can push the clutch down, select first, and lift the clutch up again to give the car a push. Well, I hope this video helps you stay safe when it's raining. If you think it does, please give the video a thumbs up and check out Collingwood and Confused in the description. Collingwood are great if you're learning to drive and want to insure yourself on a friend or family member's car because you can do so without affecting their policy or risking their no claims bonus. There's short-term policies available and long-term policies available. If you cancel a long-term policy, there is a pro rata refund for the remaining term. Via the link at the moment, there's up to 35% off and a £20 Amazon gift card. Using the link does support this channel. I also recommend checking out Confused.com because Confused allows you to compare many, many insurers, add additional drivers, take additional drivers off, play with the excess to get yourself the best quote. You don't have to keep redoing the quote. You can make these adjustments to see what comes out cheapest. Using the link in the description does support this channel, so thank you very much. Subscribe to get my future videos, and until the next one, cheerio.